Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar in bloom, successional native plantings for continuous blooms with Sydney Ross. My name is Haley and I'm the outreach and education coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today and thanks to our 2024 Grow Native sponsors. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, I will read those out to Sydney. This webinar is being recorded, and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on Sydney. Sydney Ross was raised throughout the greater Kansas City area and has set down roots in Kansas City, Missouri with her cat, Max. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics from Kansas City Art Institute in 2013. Sydney has always had a naturalist spirit with her earliest memories hiking, paddling Missouri rivers, camping with her family, and gardening with her mom. Her endless curiosity, stewardship for the earth, and background in the arts encourages her to enthusiastically inspire folks to connect with nature. She proudly leads LGBTQ plus inclusive nature programs throughout the Kansas City area and is, and is a self-proclaimed native plant nerd. Sydney is the outdoor education manager for Deep Roots, a nonprofit in Kansas City that creates community through native plant education. She is in a cooperative agreement with the Missouri Department of Conservation, where she is a naturalist and stewards the nine acres of native gardens at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City, Missouri. We are so excited to have Sydney here to look today to learn more about and nerd out with her over native plants. And now to Sydney. Thank you so much, Haley. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, thank you all for joining me today. I'm so happy to, to be here. Um, as Haley mentioned, my name is Sydney Ross. I'm the Outdoor Education Manager for Deep Roots here in Kansas City. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say you may um, have been hoping to see Alex today on this webinar. She unfortunately cannot join us, but please send your warm regards and love her way. Um, and we have a great presentation for you today. So as Haley mentioned, my background is in fine arts. I bring that up not to be braggadocious or anything like that, but just to, to remind people that you don't necessarily have to have a background in ecology or botany to, um, to create habitat in your landscape that supports wildlife. Um, and also with my fine arts background, it actually gives me um, some really great skills in terms of understanding things three-dimensionally and spatial awareness and cr creative problem solving, which helps me tremendously out in the landscape. Um, and which I mentioned, uh, I do steward the, the gardens there at the Discovery Center, and I lead work and learn gardening days to teach people uh, native gardening skills five times a month at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. And like I said, you don't need to be an expert to know what you plant matters. And so I'd like to thank both Missouri Department of Conservation and my team at Deep Roots for all of their support. All right, so in bloom, successional gardening. First of all, what is succession? Um, this is the idea that you'll have one uh, characteristic or a similar characteristic following um, one after the other. So in this case of blooms, a lot of gardeners love to uh, try to get as many blooms in their garden for as long as possible. And this is where planning really comes into play. Um, I admittedly have been a plopper at times, you know, you go into a, a garden center, um, favorite native plant nursery, and it's just, I'm a kid in a candy shop. Uh, but really considering um, just kind of how these plants work in the landscape, considering what your gardening goals are, and if the plants you currently have are reaching those goals. So are you gardening for blooms, right? So in this example, we'll be looking at blooms throughout the season, both for shade and sun situations, uh, but also consider other goals. Are you gardening for wildlife, birds? Think about the plants you have in your garden and if those are helping you reach your goal. Um, and that first bullet point there, um, I know this is about blooms, but also keep in mind textures and visual interest year round because blooms are beautiful, but there's so much beauty and other aspects of the plants, which I'll touch briefly on in this presentation. And as I said, consider every plant 
during every season. There's always something interesting to see. So you may all be surprised I'm starting off with our common violet found across the Midwest, Viola sororia. Well, just a quick note on this. I have a lot of friends with mixed feelings about violets. Personally, I love them. Historically, they're a symbol of between women and they make great ground cover, but they can be a little prolific, right? So my advice is keep your violets, but if you're worried about them being too prolific or crowding out your other species, uh, consider thinning them out away from brand new installed plants, uh, just because the, the violets do tend to have a, a pretty good foothold in our environment because they're native here. Um, so I just want to recommend keep your violets in your garden um, and work with them because they're beautiful. The flowers are gorgeous. There's lots of variation, natural variation, like the image in the top right. Um, and I just think it's a really nice place to start. Um, also, if you have violets in your yard uh, or landscape, you may have be working with shade. So the first um, set of plants we'll be looking at are shade species and all the photos taken are uh, taken by me. I took all these photos unless I have a photo credit mentioned in the image. So keep your violets. Um, another great ground cover species is uh, Packer obovata or round leaf ground sole. Golden ground sole is another common name. And the word ground cell means uh, to swallow up the ground. Now that sounds pretty intimidating, but this plant is not that at all. It is a great plant, again, ground cover. So that shorter of the uh, plant type in your garden, it fills in the gaps and creates that green mulch. Um, and the leaves, which you can see in the bottom right, stay semi evergreen throughout the year. Uh, even in winter, you could go out into the garden right now and find a patch of them and admire the green. Um, well, May not say much because in Kansas City, it's like 60 degrees today, but typically on a winter day, you'll see it anyway. Um, and I want to show uh, this, uh, the versatility of this plant. Um, and there's a few different species. There's Pacra obovata, Pacra aurea, both. Um, I think obovata is typically more commonly found at nurseries. Um, but that, the image uh, that I just showed here, this is in a woodland setting. And this is in the parking lot at the Discovery Center. So very versatile in terms of sunlight requirements. And again, they just have these cheery blooms that pop up in April, um, pair it with, um, I like to pair it with blue flowers. So uh, uh, Wild Sweet William blooms at the same time. Um, and that's a great option to pair with that. And I know this is about blooms, but let me just bring up a couple things on some sedges um, and grasses. So this is oak sedge, Carex albicans. And I like to incorporate these with my blooms uh, or my forbs rather, uh, because it gives you texture. It also um, helps with the transition between your lawn and garden, but also they do bloom. They technically do bloom, so it counts. So that's why I included it in this presentation. Though it has a tiny bloom, um, inspect and admire this spring if you can. Uh, oak sedge is great, um, especially for the woodland garden, because as many of you may know, uh, springtime is the time of year for our woodland species. That's really when they pop. Um, and as summer and fall progress, a lot of things fade out. So having that texture in there, like your sedges, will help create interest that will continue out through the year. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know about you, but this warmer weather has really got me thinking about spring ephemerals, including Virginia bluebells. Now, typically, I wouldn't recommend spring ephemerals for your garden just because they're hard to um, to cultivate. So they're not sold very commonly at nurseries. Um, and as you also well know, it's not good to dig them up from the wild. So this is the exception because there are a lot of our native plant nurseries that cultivate this species, um, Mertensia virginica. And I just, I love everything about this plant. Um, I love the foliage, the big broad leaves. Uh, this will come up mid-April. And um, the, the thing with spring ephemerals is that they, they pop up before the, the trees um, leaf out. So they're getting all that sunlight coming through the forest or woodlands and allows them to emerge. And then in the case like Virginia bluebells, once uh, the season progresses, they will die back completely. They'll look like they have never been there um, to begin with, um, but really they're just dormant or sleeping until the following year. So this is a great plant to add. Um, I did hear from Merv Wallace a good recommendation on um, seeding 
Th these are actually great plants to seed into your landscape. You can also buy plugs, which is great, you know, um, uh, but that is a, a tip that he he shared with me. And also if you love bumblebee butts, I mean, come on, here they are. And sometimes you'll get some cool variations. Um, on the far left, you'll see some pink um, flowers. The, these photos are actually from uh, Bluebell Valley, this area that I help steward in Kansas City, and it's just covered in these bluebells. So uh, near and dear to my heart, certainly. Another plant that has a similar color palette, but more of a kind of a smaller uh, not nearly a showy flower, but still very delicately beautiful is Jacob's Ladder, Hulmonium reptans. And I love this flower actually for the foliage. Uh, the flowers are great, of course, um, and they they just have this really dainty, delicate look to them. Again, a shade species or part shade. But the foliage on here, um, and this photo doesn't do it great justice, but Look up a picture of it because the foliage is just so stunning. It really fills out and it lasts through the season too. So again, continuing that visual interest into the warmer uh, seasons. Another plant that I'd like to recommend uh, for shadier areas is our woodland spiderwort. Now, this is one of those plants that um, it, it will go dormant once the heat sets in, but uh, sometimes you get a re what I like to call a rebloom. Um, where it will bloom a second time if the conditions are right. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty special plant. Um, I like the idea of planting it in clusters, so several of the same plants in one area because they are a very small plant. Um, but it's also kind of cool to see them pop up here, there in your woodland um, garden. So this is um, this is also related to Ohio spiderwort, which is a taller species, better suited for full sun situations. Um, but this one tends to be an underdog, and I, I just think there's something very uh, sweet about this plant. And uh, most of the, the plants in this presentation are forbs, but I did include a couple shrub, or this might be the only shrub, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention golden currant. Um, if you haven't smelt this plant, please come visit the Discovery Center this spring. Um, it also blooms probably about mm, end of April, May-ish. Um, and it has those yellow flowers, but the fragrance carries on the wind. It is lovely. And this, this isn't a full shade species per se. So, um, when you're looking at, you know, your shady landscape, you will have some areas on the edge that get either morning sun or hot afternoon sun. So consider, um, adding more interest, uh, bloom interest into your garden by playing with those different sun types with your plants. And also, I do encourage you to, to try to push the boundaries a little bit. You'll be surprised. Um, some plants are really, uh, well, we know native plants are resilient, but sometimes they can really shift and move around without any issues. Um, and again, I did, this is the last grass I've included in this presentation, but grass is bloom, so fair game. Uh, American beet grain. This is a plant that uh, also uh, Missouri Wildflower Nursery introduced me to. Um, actually, the first time I saw it, I was hiking at a conservation area and it was down in a low wet section and it was a monoculture, just a big wide spread of this plant. And as I was researching it, I learned it's great food for turkey and other wildlife. Um, so that's pretty cool. But in a home garden setting, um, not only is it good food for your birds, but it, it has that nice um, height variation. It's, it's much taller than the sedges I showed earlier, um, but it, it's about, I don't know, I'm doing this, it's probably 12, 16, maybe 18 inches tall, but it kind of drapes over. So I recommend interplanting, again, some grasses or sedges into your garden, um, just because they have as much value um, in the landscape as the blooms do. Okay, so we're kind of moving into later in the season. So, you know, again, I mentioned spring in the woodland, that's where the show's at. Um, as we get into summer, um, when the, the, the canopy fills out with leaves, a lot of the plants will start to go dormant if they're spring ephemerals, um, or we have more uh, smaller flowers uh, coming up in the later in the year. But woodland pink root, um, also known as um, Indian pink root, spigelia, Spigelia marilandica, probably did not say that right, 
um, but this is a fabulous plant. Um, I borrowed this photo on the left from Carol Davitt. Uh, it was on the Grow Native website, and I love seeing this in a container. Um, so not only can you add that into a woodland setting, but you could have it in a pot on your front porch in the shade. Um, now, I have experimented with putting this plant in sunnier locations, too. It does seem pretty versatile, but I love that it can handle uh, medium shade situations um, and just really needs a few hours of, of sunlight. Um, even indirect would be okay. Um, I've also had some good um, luck with, um, if you've ever watched me on Native Plants at Noon, we talk about the Chelsea chop, which is just a way of maintaining some plants um, either to control the height or encourage a second round of blooms. But essentially it, it mimics herbivory and you cut plants back at a certain time, you know, depending on the plant. And um, it the plant responds by, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to die. I need to make more flowers and make more seed. And as a result, it grows shorter with more prolific blooms. Um, this woodland pink root, I accidentally whacked one of the flower heads off and it did uh, rebloom a second time. So just so you know, if that's something you want to try, you're welcome to. Um, okay, so this plant I'm really excited about because I haven't, um, I don't think I've ever suggested this plant but it is one that's readily available uh, through Missouri Wildflower Nursery and our other local nurseries in Missouri. Um, but this is jump seed, also known as knotweed. And um, I used to I used to live in Kansas City, Kansas, and had it's where I had my first house. And there were woods just on the backside. And this plant was all up in that landscape. And it was before I knew hardly anything about native plants. And I just thought, wow, that's beautiful you know, looking into kind of the darker area of the woods and these little white flowers popping out. Um, and we do have this at the Discovery Center also. And it's just a nice little reprieve when most of the other blooms, you know, when you're getting into summertime, um, stop blooming. So this is more of a summer bloom uh, species. And um, yeah, so I recommend you check that out. It adds great texture. So it has both qualities of a forb and a sedge you know it's got the fine texture with the flower stalk and then the nice broadness of the leaves which I think adds variety into your garden design and then there's elephant foot okay I want to say the scientific name for y'all because I was just like laughing so hard yesterday elephantopus carol carolinianus but elephantopus what a great name so this cute little flower elephant foot um, was introduced to me by my friend Matt Bunch from KC Community Gardens. He was one of the former stewards at the Discovery Center when it first opened, and I still find this plant popping up in the garden beds, and it's one that he had planted. So it's it's one that I'm really, I, I usually only see um, when I'm hiking in the woods, but it's this cute little flower. Um, the, the plant's about 18 inches tall, um, maybe two feet tops and it has these tiny little flowers that you can see here and then they the the seed heads are very cute too when they dry um so this is one that will bloom in shade um and have and provide nectar for your pollinators much later in the year um i think i even saw this blooming in the fall um so this plant would be like late summer early fall um if I'm remembering correctly, but it's it's a fun one. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. See if your local native plant nursery carries it. Um, because I'd be I'd be curious to know who else is um uh, sharing this cool plant. And then of course, there's um you you all are familiar with goldenrods and asters. There are some that are woodland based. So again, some of the, the best inspiration can be gained from going out into your natural areas um, because Mother Nature does it best, she's the best designer. And um, so elm leaf goldenrod is, is a great example of that. But you will see in most of the nurseries, uh, the goldenrods that are being sold are full sun. Um, but this is a good option for shade. Um, and then uh, I couldn't find a photo of, of the aster that I wanted to share. But there's also um, woodland asters. So you can check with your native plant nursery. Because um, as you all may be aware, when we get into fall, a lot of our native plants have um, really, they're really rich in protein um, and fats so that our wildlife can get through uh, the fall and through the winter uh, 
you know, wherever they're going. And so goldenrods and asters are no exception to that. They're a crucial plant. They're uh, a lot of them are keystone species too. Um, so make sure if anything, you at least have a couple of these towards the end of the year, because uh, I don't know about you, but uh, a lot of people are super excited about spring and getting gardening going. And then summer hits in the Midwest. And then by the time fall comes back around, pretty tired, right? May not want to get in the garden. But then, you know, just don't forget about those fall blooms. Those are still important. So this spring, I hope you'll add some fall blooms to your garden too. Okay, so that I zipped through the um, the shade portion and I'm going to zip through this one as well. Um, but first, I just want to preface this with um, this is an image of the uh, from the Discovery Center at Primrose Prairie, uh, the garden that I designed and installed. It's my first public garden at the Discovery Center. And that's me <laughs> hunched over tending to the plants. And um, yeah, so it's, I like to uh, reference this because I've learned quite a bit about uh, some of these species just from working in this garden. So the first plant I want to talk about it are uh, pussy toes. Um, there's prairie pussy toes and there's um, parlins pussy toes, Antenaria neglecta or parlinii. Um, neglecta is better suited for full sun, dry situations. Parlinii does well, does does just fine, um, at least at the Discovery Center in those areas too, probably because it's getting a little more moisture. Um, but the Parlinii can do well in shade situations too, or shadier, I should say. But this is a fabulous plant. Um, I love it for the blooms. I mean, how cute is that? And if you can see in the uh, the left image, there is a native bee. Um, so they're very attractive to our uh, early spring pollinators, um, which is crucial because we have a lot of uh, queen bumblebees coming out that time of year. Um, so this is probably in like, um, I would say April-ish, maybe, maybe blooms into May also. It just kind of depends on the where it's at, the center. Um, but this is great. It's also the host plant for the American Painted Lady Butterfly. Um, so if you have pussy toes planted and by, let's see, I'm trying to remember, I think summertime, um, if they are suddenly just like totally shredded and eaten up, you are lucky. You have some beautiful butterflies that are um, um, actually in their caterpillar form that will be emerging uh, later that year. So very cool. Uh, okay. Fringe Blue Star. This plant, I fall in love with it every year. I love this plant so much. Um, I wish I had, a, I, I don't like to include videos usually in my presentations because of I always run into tech issues when I do, but come, oh, well, if you come to the plant sale, like the Grow Native or Deep Roots plant sales at the Discovery Center in the spring, see how this plant waves in the wind. It is just stunning. And that blue, I mean, it's something out of, I, I just like a painting to me. If you couldn't tell, I'm a little obsessed. Um, I, I just, I also really enjoy the foliage of this plant. Um, it is an earlier bloom. It's, we're probably in about May, I would say. Yeah, because we're looking at like April through June uh, currently in the sun, full sun species. Um, so this one is great. It doesn't, it lasts like probably a couple weeks, but it, it's worth it. And like I said, I fall in love with it every year that I see it. And the foliage um, by the time fall comes around, it is a gorgeous yellow. So the foliage actually sticks around, uh, adding some additional interest to your garden. And then there's bee balm, Monarda bradburiana. Um, you may be familiar with bee balm. Um, it is part of the mint family. It has a nice square stem, which is a good indicator. Um, now this one is not to be confused with Monarda fistulosa, which is the taller species, um, whereas Monarda bradburiana, it's so short. You can see it's almost as tall as those sedges there, um, but it is more of like, let's see, probably 18 inches tall, like maybe maybe two feet. Um, I love the versatility of this plant. It can handle, uh, not only can it do sun, um, it can handle some shade too. But if you uh, have this plant and you notice you have powdery mildew, um, it could be that it's not getting enough sunlight um, or maybe the conditions are too wet. But we have this in a couple locations at the Discovery Center. Um, both are actually in the parking lot. 
and one is under a tree so it's shaded so dry shade and the other one's in full sun so i love a versatile native plant um and you can also uh enjoy the fragrance of this plant either in tea form or just when you go and tend to your garden just give it a little sniff Ugh. i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about comb flowers so a uh, pale purple comb flower it's kind of like I think if I had a plant representing me, it'd probably be pale purple cone flower. Um, I'm a big fan of this plant. It's just has such a delicate um, ethereal nature to it. I don't know, kind of like a ballet dancer, but not only is it beautiful, very um, supportive for our wildlife here in the Midwest. Um, and I, I, one thing I want to bring up about uh, successional gardening is not only thinking about planting um certain species so you have like one blooms and then the, the other blooms when that one's finished but you can consider that with within the same uh genus right or um so comb flower or echinacea for example has several other species there's yellow comb flower which is echinacea paradoxa um and there's even i'll come back to that in a second there's even um Blade comb flower, purple comb flower. Uh, there's there's other comb flowers that aren't native in Missouri, but native in Kansas, um, and they are just a great source of food for birds, nectar for pollinators, and overwintering habitat as well for pollinators. And I just think it's a quintessential plant. So um, let me let me just kind of I want to show you this slide, and I'm going to go back to the previous slide. Uh, but on the left. Blade comb flower is going to be the first to bloom. At least that's been my experience at the Discovery Center. Um, and again, all the information I'm giving you is based on my anecdotal experiences with these plants or information that has been passed down to me from other native plant experts. Um, but in this case, um, at, in Kansas City, I always see glade comb flower comes up first, followed by pale purple comb flower, um, and then yellow comb flower. So I came back to this page because um, notice um, there's yellow comb flower on the top left, pale purple um, and that the bottom of the left image on the left. But then look at the very bottom left image or maybe even the right image. I think it's a special tea blend. Now, if you ever get a chance to uh, talk to some of the native plant nursery folks or other native plant nerds like myself, ask them about special tea blends with comb flower. I'm pretty sure this is a hybrid um, that uh, uh, these plants cross hybridize rather uh, the pale purple and the yellow comb flower to create this kind of fun in between color. Uh, you'll see natural variations like this happen, um, but I just, it really stood out to me last year. So I was delighted to share this with you in today's presentation. So yeah, if you like the qualities of one plant, like comb flower, for example, consider planting um, other species in the same garden. That way, when one blooms and passes, you have another one that has similar qualities coming up later in the season um, and providing this uh, similar um, resources to your, your wildlife. I okay, so I have to say I had to edit out a lot of photos to keep on track with the blooms um, because I just can't help but think how these plants look in fall and winter. So I had to share this because this is pale purple comb flower that I took a photo of at Kill Creek in Olathe, and it's just so cute. So another reason to leave your plant material up um, through the winter. It's cute. <laughs> Why not? Okay, um, another great uh, full sun species um, that is also a host plant for monarch butterflies is world milkweed. Um, I love this plant. I bet we actually introduced it on the uh, deep roots has a sweet 16 most likely to succeed native plant list. It's just a kind of a basic guide to get um, beginning gardeners started. Um, and I included this plant on that list uh, because it is, um, well, it's frankly, I think it's a little easier to grow than some of the other milkweeds. Um, if you've ever tried to grow butterfly milkweed and had success, I'm jealous. Um, a lot of times I have struggled to grow it at the Discovery Center, um, partly because we have a lot more rainfall there than it's usually used to, um, but also it, it just seems to be pretty finicky. Whereas world milkweed, um, it, it uh, grows rhizomatically, so it spreads out, but unlike a uh, common milkweed, which is five feet tall, world milkweed is very small. It's probably, I'm saying it's like, hmm, probably like 12 inches um, tall at most. And uh, I find that both world milkweed and marsh milkweed 
at least at the Discovery Center, seem to be the two favorites uh, milkweed types for our monarch butterflies, uh, or rather monarch caterpillars. Um, and I learned recently that different types of milkweed have different toxicity levels. So the world milkweed being having some of the highest levels make it very attractive to the monarch caterpillars. Um, but I find it attractive because of that foliage, small white clusters of flowers. Um, this is happening in summertime. So um, I'm trying to remember back when these were in bloom, probably, I think I even saw them in August. Sometimes these will even rebloom. So this is a later season plant. Um, but it, again, it's a great addition if you want milkweed in your garden, but you're either struggling to get butterfly milkweed to grow um, or common milkweed is too tall, consider this option. It's a lot smaller um, and can be very well suited for a home garden or a public facing garden for that matter. Uh, rock pink. This is such a fun plant. Um, okay. So I was, again, like looking through my photos helps me remember when plants are in bloom. So giving you permission to take tons of photos. Um, so you too can look back at your observational notes. Um, but notice in the picture on the left, there is pale purple comb flower in the background blooming. So that must've been taken probably in June. Well, last fall, these were still blooming in like September, maybe even October. And I'm curious if it was, and, I, and folks, if you have insight, please let me know in the chat. But I'm curious if the tops were nibbled off by rabbits, encouraging them to get a rebloom, or if they dropped their seeds and more just happened to grow and bloom that year. I'm very curious about it. So I'll be paying more closer attention to them this year. Um, and then also, again, another great plant to put in a pot. Um, so if you, I don't know if you got um, this month's issue of, of the Conservationist Magazine with Missouri Department of Conservation, but there's an article featuring me in there talking about container gardening with native plants. And this is one of those go-tos, that and prickly pear combo. Um, we're not here to talk about that, but I just wanted to tell you about um, if you uh, want to have blooms, but maybe you don't have a yard that you can plant into, there are options out there for you. Okay. Now this plant, um, this was my first love <laughs> once I got introduced into native plants, uh, blue false indigo or Baptisia australis. I think this is the gateway plant into the native plant world. Um, everything is stunning about this plant. Um, when it first emerges, it looks like asparagus, which I think is pretty fun. Um, but then it, it bursts into these gorgeous um, leaves that are reminiscent of um, kind of like euca a eucalyptus. Uh, to me, like a dried eucalyptus thing that I find at Trader Joe's, but so much better because the color's deep, the flowers, I mean, the the blue, bluish purple makes your eyes vibrate. Um, this blooms probably May, end of May, maybe into beginning of June. Um, and it's, it's great. Um, and it also has awesome seasonal interest, um, which I... Okay, I, I did not include the, the wintertime one, but I did include um, what the, the flowers turn into once they're pollinated. So they have these really cool seed pods um, and they, they're they a great sensory plant too because they rattle um, whether you're doing it um, or the wind blowing it. But they also are a fabulous home for the, um, there's a weevil that lives in there um, in the seeds and a Baptisia weevil. And sometimes when you open them, you can either find evidence of them or they've already emerged and there's a spider living in there. Um, so endless fun and curiosity with this plant um, and super easy to maintain too. The shape of this plant is awesome. And yeah, these photos don't do quite justice, but it is more of like a fountaining shape and it dies back every year because um, it's actually one of Missouri's tumbleweeds. So super easy maintenance, um, whether it ends up breaking off in winter time or you end up doing it yourself, um, there's nothing to it. So I love that about this plant also. Um, and uh, like coneflower and many of our other native species, there are tons of uh, different types of Baptisia. And these do, um, unlike Echinacea, each one of these Baptisias have very different shapes or structures to them. So be aware of that. Like the cream wild indigo, for example, you go out into the prairies, 
it's low to the ground because it's trying not to get blown <laughs> blown down by the winds on the prairies. Um, and like wild indigo, for example, much taller spikes, closer in shape to uh, the blue baptisia, but um, not quite as full. So I would say the um, this one is definitely more shrub-like. Um, and definitely give it the room. I know when you first get these plants, they look so small, but these babies eventually will mature to be like five feet round if you're lucky. Um, so keep that in mind with these. So they all have kind of different shapes. And I'm curious, have any of you uh, grown yellow wild indigo? Because I haven't, and I'm really excited to try that this year. Um, I really want to plant that somewhere in the landscape. May end up being at my house, but perhaps at the Discovery Center. We'll see what I can get away with. Okay, now um, I want us to look at late summer to fall. So uh, we're getting into July, October. These are really, really hot days, even though um, uh, September, October, well, I'd say September is just hot nowadays. I don't know, but um, these are all prairie inspired full sun species. And this photo is straight out of the bioswales at the Discovery Center. I mean, look how gorgeous that is. Um, this photo was taken at the very end of June, the probably the first week of July, actually. So um, it's kind of cool to see what is blooming when. And of course, it shifts slightly just depending on our weather and, and other variables. But um, so I did want to share with you all um, a suggestion about blazing stars. If you don't have them in your garden, please add them. They are just so beautiful. Um, this is a great full sun species. Uh, provides endless sources of nectar for bees, butterflies, um, especially monarchs. They love the eastern blazing star as they're migrating down to Mexico. Um, but I recommend you plant one of, well, not just one of each species, multiple of each species, but multiple species in your garden. Um, so the first to bloom at the Discovery Center will be the prairie blazing star, which is Liatris pycnostatia. Um, Again, it feels like a quintessential plant. It's just iconic in a native garden. Um, and I love that it blooms from the the um, the bottom up, kind of like a sparkler, uh, which is different because I think a lot of plants typically bloom from the top down. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and they also hold on to their seeds and their um, uprightness um, over over the season. Um, so that's the first one to bloom, followed by Liatris scariosa, eastern blazing star. Again, I mentioned monarchs cannot get enough of this plant for their nectar. Uh, they just absolutely love it. And there was, in fact, there was one just a, like one monarch last fall that was obsessed with, with that plant in the middle. I was able to walk up to it, pick it up, tag it for monarch watch, and then put it back and it like didn't even care. So I think that's pretty, pretty good indication that um, our native pollinators are big fans of this plant. And then of course, dotted blazing star. It blooms much later than the other blazing stars, but still has that very magnetic color, um, kind of a blue or not blue, purpley magenta and uh, very attractive. So consider adding multiple species from the same genus, just so you can get that same quality um, uh, longer over time. And the mountain mints. So um, I, I'm i obsessed with insects, especially wasps. Um, and I know they get a bad rep. I know some of you are going, but please bear with me. Um, when we plant certain plants like mountain mints, the white flowers are very attractive to them. And so attractive that I can put my face this close to the flower and the wasps don't mind that I'm there looking at them. But please check, take a look at it sometime. If you don't have this in your garden, come visit the Discovery Center in the, the late summer um, because it's a smorgasbord and the shapes and colors of these insects are just so, so beautiful and very interesting. And not to mention, this is a mint that will not take over your garden. So unlike uh, the non-native mints that, or culinary mints, um, I should say traditional Western culinary mints um, that, that people know not to plant it directly into the ground unless they want a monoculture. These won't do that. Um, and they do, but you can uh, enjoy them um, as you would any other tea or dried uh, mint. 
So uh, definitely check that out. And then there are a couple other species um, as well. Um, this one's hairy mountain mint. Um, and then there's also, um, let's see. Yeah, there's there's also something called Virginia mountain mint. So again, if, if you like mint and you love wasps like I do, and you want to support them and other pollinators longer into the season, go ahead and add these. Um, hairy mountain mint does persist pretty late in the season and even after the blooms are done has gorgeous interest. Uh, the seed heads are nice. The leaves stay intact. It has a good upright appearance. Um, big fan of these, of the mountain mints. Also, okay, when we get in the dog days of summer, like even, even when some like blazing stars are having a hard time because of the heat, um, Rudbeckias are also a great addition. Um, and I know you may be like, okay, Sid, I've planted some Rudbeckias that have just gone bonkers bananas. Well, I'm here to tell you that I think the Rudbeckia herda is a good option. It doesn't seem to go too crazy. Um, the only plant, there's one plant, uh, sweet coneflower, which I can't remember the uh, Latin name right now, but that is one, it's a Rudbeckia, it's not actually a coneflower. It is one that is very prolific and can be um, a little too robust uh, if and doesn't play as well with others, but this plant does. Rudbeckia herda, when, when nothing else is blooming, when it's hot, you have this cheery little friend there um, to greet you. And uh, again, getting that late season bloom and um, support for wildlife. Uh, you probably can't tell, but there's a little metallic green sweat bee on this flower here on the right. Um, so that's very cool. Okay, um, so we're getting towards the end. I just have a couple more slides uh, before we jump into Q&A. Um, but I wanna tell you about, just mention a few goldenrod varieties that you might consider. Um, uh, and you all, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but goldenrod's not responsible for your ragweed allergies. Um, ragweed doesn't look like this, and ragweed is wind pollinated, whereas our goldenrods are insect pollinated. Um, so these are not the the ones responsible for your sneezing, um, but they are responsible for being very cute and beautiful. So Rydell's goldenrod, rigid goldenrod, and cliff goldenrod. Um, now I will admit I'm not entirely sure which ones bloom first um, and in which order. Uh, that's something I'm going to focus on this year because goldenrods can actually be really challenging to identify. Same with some asters. So I'm hoping to up my game this year and pay attention to the phenology or um, the the time uh, which things happen. And I love recording that in my nature journal. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know, just nerd stuff. You know how it goes. Um, but I do want to mention Cliff Goldenrod, um, unlike some of these other, like the Rigid and the Riddells, has a very different uh, structure to it. So it is more of a um, arching kind of hanging over plant. Awesome on terraces. Awesome on anything that is a little taller that it can kind of climb over like you see here on this rock wall or retaining wall. Um, but we also have it in the parking lot at the Discovery Center, um, just, you know, by the bioswales, like on the ground, at ground level. And it's it's also great. It doesn't lay flat. Like, even though it has that kind of arching shape to it, it does lift off the ground and then do it. So whether you have it at a, um, a higher uh, height in your landscape or if it's within everything, um, it's a great addition, but a slightly shorter species compared to the others. Oh, and then I'll just mention, if you go to any of your native plant nurseries, type in goldenrod and you'll see like a dozen um, different types. Uh, I didn't want to make this presentation any longer than it is uh, for your sake, but I wanted to give you a start at some cool uh, goldenrod species to consider. And then the asters, of course, I have to mention asters because as I mentioned earlier, goldenrods and asters are so crucial for our fall pollinators. Uh, they're packed full of yummy, nutritious nectar and pollen, um, and they're beautiful. So I want to mention a few of these here and talk just briefly about maintenance because um, asters, you love them or you hate them. I love them and you should too. And this is why uh, not only are they supportive of our wildlife, but they're actually really easy to maintain. Um, so if you have, um, oh, I just realized top right is not silky aster. That's New England aster. Um, and that is the one I specifically want to talk about um, 
well, one of the one of the ones. Um, but anyway, this the New England aster in the top right tends to be very tall here in Kansas City. I'm assuming it's the same way in Columbia, St. Louis, pretty much anywhere that's not like out in the middle of a prairie. Um, because I remember going on a prairie walk at Goodnight Henry Prairie with Missouri Prairie Foundation, and they pointed out the New England aster, and it was like 20 inches tall, whereas the ones we get that uh, grow um, at the Discovery Center, they can get almost seven feet tall. Why is that? Well, you know, our soils here, again, I mentioned um, in, in a landscape setting, they they tend to be a little more spoiled. Um, they We tend to have more clay also here um, in Kansas City and more rainfall. So all those contributor, contribute to having some of our prairie species tending to get really tall. So what do you do about that? Well, if you like them tall, you don't have to do much. Uh, not anything actually except enjoy. But if you don't like them uh, getting that tall, consider that Chelsea chop method I mentioned earlier where you cut back the plant. Um, now, just be aware, um, New England aster is a great one to cut back because it already is boisterous. Uh, but just make sure if you do, you're doing this in June. Um, June is a great time to cut back asters and goldenrods um, and other late summer um, or fall plants that tend to get too tall in your landscape. Um, you can cut them back. I like to say like a third or sorry, two thirds of the height, the overall height of the plant. But if you aren't sure what that is, um, go slow. You can always do more next year. You could also cut part of it, uh, like leave it, most of it up, cut part of it, see the difference between the two, um, just to advance, you know, how you uh, like to handle your, your landscape. Um, but this is a great way. If you do have a, a plant that is a little too tall, it's flopping, um, consider cutting it back in June. And then, uh, <laughs> if we're in a drought, you have to water it too. I'm laughing because I tried this on a goldenrod um, in Primrose Prairie a couple of years ago, and I just nearly killed the, those poor plants because I didn't give them any water afterwards. So learn from my mistake. Take care of your plants if you are going to do that method. Um, and and uh, yeah, so go from there. Uh, the two other species here I want to mention, Silky Aster on the left. Um, it's a gorgeous plant. It's smaller. Um, it, it has um, not quite like um, a nice giant cluster of blooms. They're more spread out, which I, I do appreciate. Same with the sky blue aster. Um, and I believe sky blue aster can handle some slight shade as well, but most of these are full sun species. Um, and I mentioned how silky aster doesn't quite have the, the bloom mass um, as aromatic aster does. Uh, just look at this. So uh, again, this is one of those plants. I, I it very it seems very polarizing for people. Um, I love aromatic aster though, um, but it's one of those plants where if it's happy, it's gonna go. So um, if you are like, ah, oh, yeah, I too love this plant, but what do I do about managing it? Um, if you don't want a plant to spread, you might consider cutting it off before it goes to seed, like you know, deadheading it afterwards. Um, but again, that all depends on your goals as a gardener. Um, so that is a method that I've done, but this plant, I tell you, it blooms through October. There was one year it was blooming into November in my front yard. Um, and that was actually an interesting space because it's the North side of the house. So it didn't quite get as much sun. Um, but it, it did great. It looks really beautiful. So if you don't have this, um, or an, any kind of aster or goldenrod in your garden, consider adding that this year. Okay. Well, thank you all. I appreciate us running through this. Um, uh, I know we went a little long, but I can stick around for the Q&A. All right. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Sydney. My eyes are vibrating with all of these <laughs> wonderful photos. And I know. It gets me so excited about spring. Me too. I was, I, I was so giddy putting this together for y'all. So thank you for the opportunity. Yes, so we do have uh, several questions that um, I will say that if you did put a question into the chat, if you could move it over to the Q&A section, that would make things mm -hmm. a lot easier for, for us. So <laughs> thank you for that in advance. Um, and our first question that came in was from Monica, and she wanted to know if there are any other spring blooming natives that will help bees. And I did want to just quickly mention that on the Grow Native website, 
Uh, we have a top 10 list category of for all different um, topics. And one of those would be top 10 plants for bees in spring. So please be sure to check that out as well. But if you have other suggestions, feel free to me. Totally. So, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, again, is that Virginia bluebell I mentioned, um, only because that's some of the first, uh, those plants are very important for, for bumblebees, which are uh, the first, the queens are the first to emerge in spring. So you might be considering other plants that are blooming around that time. Um, and again, a lot of those end up being spring ephemerals, um, which are difficult to find in stores, but you might consider, um, you know, pawpaws, for example, have blooms in the spring and they support some of our earliest pollinators which include flies flies are important pollinators too um and so that could be something to consider wild ginger um if you have wild ginger can be tricky if um like you need the you know good soil quality like lots of leaf litter that sticks around so it's not super dry and compact um, but that also has early blooms that can support some of the earliest pollinators but uh, definitely check out the sources on grow natives website i love referring to those top 10 lists they're really fantastic they are helpful thank you so much all right um anna had a question about um, if you have any suggestions for the the time between your daffodils, if you're a daffodil um, gardener, and the between the daffodils and the irises, if, if there's mm. something that fills that gap because she feels like that is a gap for her. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm trying to think of, okay, you know, I, uh, so funny enough, there are some daffodils that pop up at the Discovery Center, um, which won't surprise anybody because it, there used to be houses um, at the Discovery Center. That's what it was originally. And we've left the daffodils as an homage to the people who've lived there before. So I'm trying to, in my mind's eye, envision what's growing out there, but that's pretty early in the spring. So again, I know I, I said Virginia bluebells is coming to mind, but that is one of the earliest uh, native plants that we have blooming in, in the um, shade. So that's what I'd recommend. But I also can't think of when the non-native irises start to bloom. I think it's June. So I feel like it's a pretty good gap, like end of March through June. So um, I would just refer back to this presentation or, or um, check out the other resources. Great. Thank you. All right, um, there have been several concerns or questions about, uh, you had mentioned the jump seed and oh. and someone wanted to know if that's, uh, Elizabeth wanted to know, is jump seed the same as Japanese knotweed? It's not, um, common names are so complicated. Um, they're, they're helpful too, right? So that, um, you know, people like me who don't have a background in botany can have uh, at least a start on that plant, but you know, the one I recommended is not the uh, non-native invasive one. Um, I would never recommend anybody plant non-native invasives, but consider the native jump seed. Again, it's an underdog. I don't see it in other people's gardens. I, I think I see cultivars um, or maybe some non-native varieties like the, the invasive one, um, but the native kind's very cool. All right, thank you. All right, the next question is from Gail, and she wanted to know how easily milkweed transplant and transplants, and she specifically wanted to know about butterfly milkweed. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to tell you this. It doesn't transplant well. So anything with a taproot, which is, if you think of a carrot, that's the kind of root structure, um, or even a corm, which you'll see on blazing stars, which kind of look like a bulb, but essentially they're just one bigger stock stock that goes underground and they're so fragile. Um, I honestly, I, <laughs> my friends have had better luck just throwing butterfly milkweed seed on the ground. I'm not even kidding. A friend of mine who has mulch in the shade in their front yard broadcasted butterfly milkweed seeds. Okay. It's not full shade. They have like after a couple hours of afternoon sun. They have butterfly milkweed growing all over the place. And I'm just like, I give up. <laughs> I don't, but, but try that um, because transplanting doesn't work very well for, for milkweeds in general, but butterfly milkweed especially does not like it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jasmine had just a comment that she feels that 
yellow indigo is the easiest to grow. So I hope you have luck Yay! with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Cause I know Baptiste, um, the blue false indigo takes about five years for it to really get established. So if you have it, be patient, but good to know about the yellow one. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Leslie said, if I pick the Baptisia seed and remove the seed, will the plant fade away? And does removing the seed in the fall promote a smaller plant in the next spring? It does not, unfortunately. Um, and, and picking the seed pot off won't um, affect the, that specific plant that you remove the seed pod from other than uh, limit, you know, potentially limiting its ability to reseed. Um, but yeah, the, um, no. Um, so it sounds like you might have a very mature plant. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes like we have one that's kind of in a not so ideal location um, up against the sidewalk. And we oftentimes will have to cut back part of it and shape it um, so that's not a uh, block in people's way. Um, but again, it's a very easy plant to maintain. Um, it's very intuitive to cut it back just to, to the areas that you need. All right. Thank you. Um, Anna would like to know, um, uh, well, she had a, a question about a new pollinator garden that would be like 10 by five to support wildlife. Um, mm -hmm. And she wanted to know if we have a, a listing of plants for those, for that type of space would, that would have continuous blooms. That is a lot and I love it. That's a great question. So um, of course, Haley mentioned the, the resources on Grow Native's website. I mentioned also Deep Roots has a sweet 16, most likely to succeed. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there uh, for like best choice plants for the beginning gardener. Um, but my biggest recommendation to you, um, since it's a smaller footprint, um, keep it, keep the border nice and tidy. Uh, consider shorter plants on the outside. Um, if it's uh, a garden bed that you can walk around the entire way, have the taller plants in the center. Otherwise, if it's a front facing garden bed, taller plants in the back, kind of the, the basics um, that I suggest when getting a garden going, but good luck and I'm excited for you. All right. And then Teresa says she's in zone 4B in Southwest Wisconsin. So hello up there. Hello, Wisconsin. And she was wondering if these native plants grow in zone 4B. Hmm. Um, I will just mention real briefly that on our Grow Native website, we have a native plant database and it is linked with the plant zones. So any plant that you look up, then you can then see if that plant works in your particular zone. Well, that's good because I, I don't frankly I don't know about zones personally um but <laughs> so sorry I can't help you there but also Bonap um and I I'm blanking on the acronym but that's a a great um resource to look up uh, ranges too so I can um make sure we send that out with y'all okay all right thank you. All right, uh, here we go. Okay, so it is just now going to be five. So I'm going to take about three to four more like, questions. Yeah, I'm Are good with that. Good? Totally. We have 30 questions left. <laughs> and so I'm thinking we'll take, uh, maybe we'll go till a little after five, and then maybe what we don't get through with, perhaps we can uh, work out a way to get those questions answered for folks. Happy to do that. And thank you all so much for your questions and your comments. This really makes uh, presenting enjoyable. So appreciate you all. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jackie would like to know what your experience is with a uh, zigzag goldenrod. Ooh, okay. Very limited, but I'm very excited because um, Alex actually designed and um, and then I we all helped install the South Pond garden bed at the Discovery Center, which is a showcase of all kinds of goldenrods, including gray goldenrod. Um, and I guess the, the, the lo short answer long, I don't have much experience, but I do know it grows well in that location, which is a uh, full sun. Um, it's right on the edge of a pond um, and it's surrounded by 
like 10 other goldenrod species, which is why I'm having a hard time identifying it because they all look kind of similar. So wish me luck this year that I figure out what's what. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, now, Jen wanted to know, um, are all cone flowers invasive? And um, <laughs> well, I will, I'll just let you handle that if you okay. don't. No, uh, no, no, none of the comb flowers, um, none of the plants I mentioned in this presentation are invasive. Uh, let me, let me just go over briefly the definition of invasive, um, invasive, well, okay. I, invasive for some people means aggressive or prolific, but in the native plant world, when we're talking about invasive species, truly what we should be talking about are non-native species that uh, negatively impact our environment and economy. So there aren't, there's not a single cone flower that's native to North America that would be considered invasive. Um, if anything, they're just a really important source of food for our wildlife. Um, so yeah, they can be prolific. They can be um, gregarious, um, or you can use more negative words, but uh, they're not invasive. Uh, but I will mention they are a short-term or short-lived perennial. So if um, if you notice your uh, cone flowers aren't coming back, consider overseeding with more cone flower seeds in the winter, because um, that's happening to us. I mean, it ha it just happens. Oh, okay. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Um, do you have, are there any tips or tricks Jackie wants to know for sunflowers um, being too tall? Yes, you can do the Chelsea chop. I, we did that with sunflower or um, willow leaf sunflower. Yeah, you can totally do it. So um, I think anything in the uh, Asteracea family, um, you can uh, potentially try that method with, but it works beautifully. So um, willow leaf sunflower is such a funny plant. If you haven't seen it, I love it. It's very charismatic, but it can get really tall. So we cut it back and usually it, it um, only has like maybe one or two flowers. When you cut it back, it has like a whole, it's like a bouquet per stem. So try it, see what you think. I don't know about the annual sunflowers now, um, but native uh, or rather the perennial uh, silphiums, helianthus, helioopsis, those can, uh, you can attempt that Chelsea chop. Um, otherwise, you could consider it for annuals. I haven't done this, but an annual sunflower, you could try planting the seed a little later. So it, I don't know. I don't know if that would work, <laughs> but it's worth a shot. Sounds like an experiment. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Dennis asked for any local sources for native plant seed. Yeah, so my biggest recommendation is try to get uh, plants and seeds as close to home as possible. Um, and when I when I say that, I mean buy from uh, local businesses because they're going to have the genotypes or rather the the genetic diversity in their uh, plants and their seeds that's appropriate for our region. Um, some plants that uh, may grow here and let's say like Wisconsin, Minnesota, yeah, they may be the same species, but one like the ones from Minnesota, Wisconsin are probably used to colder temps than, and maybe not as accustomed to our heat down here. Um, so I would start there, go to your local nurseries, uh, Missouri wildflower nursery based in Jeff city has great. Um, they, they usually have seeds available. Um, Hamilton natives, uh, Hamilton, what is it? Hamilton native outpost. I know MDC buys from there sometimes. Um, and then if I'm in a pinch, I will go to Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, I, there, it's a fabulous nursery. Don't get me wrong. But again, I'm trying to keep the plants um, or get the, the plants and the seeds as close to home as possible. Um, and again, if you, if you do forage or rather collect seeds, just make sure you get permission from landowners and please do not poach plants. It's just not nice. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. All right. And then how tall does golden golden current get becky wanted to know yeah that's a great question so um it's a shrub um but the one at the discovery center it's mostly in shade so it tends to be shorter i would say it's about three and a half feet tall the photo that i've shared in my presentation looks closer to five feet tall um it could also could just be the the way the photo is taken but now i'm thinking about it i've also seen one in full sun 
and it's maybe also three and a half feet. So I'd say probably somewhere between three and four feet tall um, and maybe about as wide. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Sarah said that she planted a silky aster this year. It bloomed in the fall, great. got hit hard by the freeze and she's wondering now if she should cut it back. You know, um, I will always say it depends on your gardening goals. If your goal is to support wildlife through the winter, which we are still in, I would say wait, um, because there's a lot of life in our um, uh, standing dead plant material that you may not just be able to see, right? So um, I would leave it up um, just until maybe we have consistent temperatures in the in the 40s or 50s, uh, long enough to allow insects to emerge. But again, that really depends on your gardening goals. If it it's looking un, um, a little messy and untidy and you're like, well, I've got other plants I'm leaving up, you could cut it back. And if you were to do it, I would just say, you know, leave probably like anywhere from like 10 inches or six to 10 inches tall um, for that plant. I don't, I don't believe there's any over, I don't know that insects overwinter in the stems of that plant because um, they're not as pithy as like comb flower and smooth hydrangea. Uh, but that's not to say it's impossible or not a thing. I just don't know. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Allie wanted to know if you can cut common wil milkweed and it will bloom again. Um, let's see. I don't, it's possible. You know, actually it, it is possible. I was thinking back, I'm like, have I seen that before? Um, we don't, we don't typically do it because we love the height of it. Like we have it interplanted in, in, in places where it works at the center. Um, but we had, we did have an um, unordained volunteer <laughs> last year who um, unfortunately ripped out some plants um, and they have, they, they ripped out or they broke the marsh milkweed that was growing in the, um, in the parking lot and it rebloomed. <laughs> so it can, I don't know if I'd recommend it. Um, I know maybe com with common milkweed with how tall it gets, you could try it as an experiment. Let me know if it works. But I think if your goal is to support monarchs, I probably would just leave it and not cut it back. Right. All right, thank you. Um, Sharon says she wants to plant natives in the front of her uh, in front of her front porch, which faces east. And that would that be considered shade or sun? Hmm. That's a great question. So I like to think about sun and shade in this way. If you have a spectrum, sun's over here and shades over here. Um, sorry, so my camera it's like flip, so that just threw right. me off. Sun's over here. Um, and shades over here. So we'll start with shade. Um, so full shade, I mean, it's like you're maybe getting some indirect light um, and then you move to part shade, which is think of morning sun. The morning sun, it's cooler, um, it's not as intense. Um, and then you get to um, full or part sun, which would be more of the afternoon hot sun. Um, and then you get to full sun. So for east facing, uh, you're gonna have that part shade, um, cooler sun, um, you, you know, and if you don't have any trees, then you will still have some full sun situation. So my biggest piece of advice, um, whether you're starting a garden or you have one established, go spend some time outside and just pay attention to where the light's hitting, but also when, what time of day, because that really dictates a lot. Um, yeah. Great advice. Thank you. All right. Um, so Cindy wondered, uh, she realized that she planted her Baptisia too close to other plants and she just planted those last year. Can she move them in the spring? I would go for it. Um, give it, I would give it a wide berth when you dig it out. I'm not as familiar with the root system of Baptisia, but I know like, I know they're not easy to, to tr I, I don't think they're easy to transplant but I think since you just, if you just planted it like in the fall, um, you should be able to um, just to try it. Yeah. And I'd recommend uh, sooner than later if you are going to try it. Great. Thank you. Sharon has some um, hungry deer and she wants to know if you have any, you have any suggestions for protecting mm -hmm. plants because they eat everything that she plants. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it, we are very lucky at the Discovery Center. We don't have a deer pressure, but um, some recommendations would be planting things that are not appetizing, especially initially, because once you're getting a garden started, it's like an open buffet for them. You have one plant here, one plant there, and it's like, hey, thanks. It's very obvious. Um, but when you get really thick plantings, um, it does get easier, but it's like, you're like, okay, so how do I get to that point? Well, consider um, so things in the mint family, um, uh, anything that's kind of prickly, um, and then also sedges. Like if um, I have a friend who I, I planted her whole garden in her backyard, and I think the rabbits ate probably 80% of what I planted because there's no other food for them. You know, I, I can't blame them. I gave them this awesome opportunity. But I'm like, okay, that sucks because we're trying to like get it going. Um, so I'm I'm actually going to go back this year and plant a bunch of oak sedge first and then seed some forbs or um, flowers into that bed because it's also a struggle. Um, someone in the chat mentioned spraying with egg white and mint flavor. I haven't tried that, but I know you can, you know, some people use cayenne pepper for squirrels. Um, and then if you're if you're trying to like plant shrubs and trees, I would recommend having a cage around it. Um, it doesn't necessarily like if it's a really tall or like, you know, taller tree, you can make the cage wider just so they can't reach into it. Um, or if it's a small or short plant, you could do it taller so they can't um, bend into it. Um, again, this is all theoretical for me because I haven't had the, the honor <laughs> of dealing with deer, unfortunately. All right. Um... Thank you for that. Austin wanted to know, um, you know, are there any tried and true uh, natives for residential neighborhoods where people are only accustomed to boxwoods, azaleas, and other non-natives? Yeah, um, I really want to encourage that uh, that sweet sixteen list I mentioned, um, just because it it ha it's it was created by a group of native plant experts. Um, and with the idea of like city ordinances in mind. Um, so and we're, I'm actually working with city of Casey Mo to update their um, weed ordinances right now um, or how they view, rather how they view their landscaping ordinances to include, be more inclusive of native plants. Um, and that list is a great resource. So I'll be sure to share that with you, Haley. But um, some of those plants were included in this presentation, but I hear you. It can be really challenging to uh, shift the social norm, right? So again, the, the recommendations is starting small, make sure you have uh, uh, defined borders, um, shorter plants in the front, you know, uh, keep your sidewalks and driveway clear of, of plants flopping over. Things like that will really um, encourage people to uh, plant native and not be so afraid of it. All right, thank you. Um, so a question from Shay coming in is the first blazing star you pictured, she, which would have been- uh, I think the false blue false indigo. I think it was the blue one or oh, is it blazing white? star? The oh, first blazing star. That would have been prairie. Um, yeah, prairie blazing star. And then it was Eastern blazing star and then dotted. Blazing. Yes. Yeah. So, so Shay says that theirs doesn't stand up straight. It curves to the ground. Okay. Wanted to know if there's a way, if, you know, if there's something that can be done about those. Totally. So what, um, the grass is baby. That's where they come into play too. So not only is it good to have a variety of textures on the surface, um, right? Because certain plants can help hold each other up, but the the root morphology, which just means the root, the shape of the roots um, can also support each other under the surface of the soil. So great example at the Discovery Center, um, right when you walk up uh, those, those two squares that have like prairie drop seed, um, and uh, blazing star. So having uh, different uh, types of plants with different root structures can really support each other, um, both in, in, in a lot of different ways, but also um, with the structure. So I'd recommend that. Um, I We still have like, there's a couple uh, situations where blazing star flops. Like if, if it's up against like the edge um, of a sidewalk, it sometimes can do that. And in that case, I'll just grab some bamboo hoops I like to get them from Gardener's Edge 
and um, just stick them in there to help them stay upright. But typically you can do some interplanting with uh, different shaped plants essentially is, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so um, since it's 5.15 and we still have about 20 questions to go, I thought it might be a good time to um, to pause and perhaps, um, you know, we spoke about this possibility before the webinar, so I want to make sure it's okay for me to send questions to you for you to answer and I can get those um, back to those who are on the call. Yeah, send them to me. I'll, I'll uh, respond to you tonight and you can send it out tomorrow. Well, that would be great. Um, I really appreciate all of your wonderful suggestions and your awesome personality. You're so oh, fun. To, you. You're to, fun. I like spending time with you too, Haley. It's always yeah. a pleasure. So thank you for having me and thank you, Grow Native. Um, thank you, Missouri Department of Conservation and Deep Roots. And don't forget what you plant matters. <laughs> That's right. And um, also, as mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent to you tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources. So if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar. It will be a Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And it's entitled Native Grassland Birds, Population Trends and Conservation with Dana Ripper and Ethan Duke with MRBO. So again, thank you all so much for hanging out with us this uh, fine last day of January, and we'll see you all around. Thanks so much.